welcome to video three, the final final video of this week's work. Um, so we have covered this week so far factors that affect air resistance and drag, factors that affect horizontal distance travel by projectile. We've looked at free body diagrams, resultant force diagrams, so parallelograms of force. We've looked at parabolic and non-parabolic flight paths. In this video, we are going to be looking at lift force, the angle of attack and the Bernoulli principle, and we're going to be looking at spin and the Magnus effect. So let's get going. So, have you ever wondered how ski jumpers stay in the air for so, for so long? I don't know if you've seen them where they, they go down the, the slope and then they take off and the, the the object is to try and stay in there as long as possible and jump as far as possible. Um, there's a video that you can watch, but essentially ski jumpers use the principle of lift to increase the time that they hang in the air for, so they can extend the flight path and the horizontal distance that they cover. So Daniel Bernoulli, in the 18th century, he created this principle, and it's known as Bernoulli's principle, um, and it is an essential um, technical aspect in sport. Um, so the Bernoulli principle basically states that the creation, there's a creation of an additional lift force on a projectile in flight, resulting from Bernoulli's conclusion that the higher the velocity of airflow, the lower the surrounding air pressure. So the faster the air's moving, the lower the air pressure. So, a little bit of a task to try and demonstrate this principle. I'd like you to get an A4 piece of paper. I'd like you to hold it portrait by the top two corners and hold the top line of the paper up to your mouth. And in a long, slow breath, I just want you to blow along the upper surface of the paper. So blow over the top of the paper. Um, what happens? Pause the video, give it a go. Okay, so you should find that as you're blowing over the paper, the paper will lift up. While you're just um, holding it up against your mouth, it will hang down. And as you blow over the top of the paper, the paper will actually lift up. And this is because you are creating an aerofoil shape with that piece of paper. Now, you are creating a curved upper surface and a flat underneath surface. So, as this shape moves through the air, the air is forced to part and flow at different velocities above and below the projectile in order to meet at the same time. The airflow has to start here and meet at the same time. Now this affects the pressure of the airflow above and below the aerofoil um, and a pressure gradient forms. So the curved upper surface forces airflow to travel a further distance and therefore it has to move at a higher velocity to meet the other airflow at the end point. The flat underneath surface has less um, distance to travel and therefore the air travels at a comparatively lower velocity. Now, what this means is, so as the velocity increases, the pressure decreases. So above the curved upper surface, there is a low pressure zone, low air pressure zone. And below the surface, there's a relatively high pressure zone because that air is moving slower. Now fluids move from an area of high to low pressure. And objects move from, which creates the additional lift force. So what happens is because this area here has a high speed airflow and low pressure, and this has a high pressure, the object will move from high pressure upwards to low pressure, which creates a lift force. Now you can see here the ski jumper has created that same aerofoil tear shape with his body, and that's how he creates lift in the air. Now let's have a look at a discus. So you can see the direction of travel, and you can see if it's thrown flat, it's not got that aerofoil shape. However, if you angle it, and tilt it, there is an optimal angle of attack which is 17 degrees. Now that 17 degrees acts an, as an aerofoil, so the airflow goes over the top and underneath and it maximises Bernoulli's lift force. So there you can see the diagram, so the airflow is having to travel up and over, so that's moving faster and therefore you get a lift force, which means the discus stays in the air for longer, therefore making it travel further. So, there are four different ways that we can demonstrate Bernoulli's principle. So we can use an airflow diagram, like you've just seen on the previous slide. We can use a free body diagram, 
a resultant force diagram or a flight path diagram. Now we have looked at the, the bottom three diagrams all previously, but we're going to go through each one now and apply it to the Bernoulli's principle. So the first one, the airflow diagram. So this shows that the airflow opposes the direction of motion. So the motion, the object is traveling in this direction, the airflow is opposed, and it, you can see the arrows there showing that the airflow is traveling in that direction. Um, you have to label the velocity and the pressure both above and below the object. So you can see here high velocity, low pressure on the top, low velocity, high pressure underneath. And then you show the lift force acting from the center of mass. And this will help to explain the Bernoulli principle. So if you're asked in a question to explain Bernoulli principle, you can draw this diagram to help assist the words that you are using. Now you can also use a free body diagram. So it shows all three forces acting on the discus. So it shows the weight, it shows the air resistance, and it shows the lift force, which is a vertical force. And it illustrates what forces act on a projectile in flight. The resultant force diagram, as I said before, so we've got the weight, the air resistance, and then your resultant force using the parallelogram. However, it shows the sum of all forces. Now, because there will be lift acting on the projectile as well, normally, say for example, this is a shot put, the weight arrow would be longer. But if you're, you, or say, say this is a discus, the weight arrow would be longer. But because you've got lift acting on it as well, you reduce the length of your weight arrow to, to show that there is lift force as well. So that arrow actually demonstrates weight minus lift force, and that's what you have to label it as. And then for, therefore the lift reduces the force of the weight. It shows the overall effect of an aerofoil in flight, very similar to a free body diagram. And then the final diagram is a flight path diagram. So note you have a non-parabolic flight path here, and extended horizontal distance traveled because of the lift. So it shows the effect of the horizontal distance the discus travels. So it shows the overall effect of an aerofoil in flight. So here you have this point here, that's the peak of the parabolic flight. So what I would like you to do is I'd like you to pause this video and I'd like you to apply the Bernoulli principle to a javelin in flight and a ski jumper in flight. For each example, I'd like you to draw an airflow, a free body, a resultant force, and a flight path diagram to demonstrate your knowledge and understanding of what is happening. I would like you then to email your photos of your diagrams to me to check over and then um, restart this video. Okay, so downward lift force. So what if that aerofoil shape was the other way around? Well, basically, Bernoulli's lift force will work in a downward direction. The principle remains the same. It's just reversed. So your airflow would be going slower over the top, therefore it has a higher pressure, and it would be travelling faster underneath, so it'd have a lower pressure underneath, therefore creating a downward force. Now, this is used loads in Formula One or track cycling to increase the downward force holding the car and the bike to the track at high speeds around the corners. So in Formula One, the front wing funnels the air down through the narrow space underneath the car's chassis, and then the spoiler bar at the back acts as an inverted aerofoil. So if you look at it from the side, it's an aerofoil shape, and it forces air underneath it to travel a further distance, creating the downward force. It creates a pressure gradient between above the spoiler bar and below the spoiler bar, which helps to pin the car to the track. And it also helps to increase your friction and your grip. So if a Formula One car travels at approximately 120 miles per hour, then the car would stay attached to the track surface even if it was turned upside down, and that is because of Bernoulli's principle. So I'd like you to pause the video, I'd like you to take a couple of minutes and I'd like you to complete this paragraph, filling in the gaps. Okay, so in track cycling, the seat of the bike and the low handlebars create a flat upper body surface to create an aerofoil shape. This is not only streamlined to reduce 
air resistance, but also helps to generate an additional force. The airflow underneath the cyclist has to travel a greater distance or further distance and therefore travels at a higher velocity, creating an area of low pressure. The pressure gradient formed generates an additional downward lift force, increasing the effects of weight on the track. Friction and therefore grip are maximised. So that's Bernoulli's principle. Um, there is a second principle that you need to know and it is all about spin and the Magnus effect or the Magnus force. So there are a few YouTube videos that you can watch. The fourth one is probably the most important. You can access it just by searching in YouTube Magnus effect basketball dam and you will see a video of someone dropping a basketball off of a dam from a great height and it shows you the, the effect on that basketball. So basically, Heinrich Magnus um, in the 19th, early 19th century applied fluid mechanics to rotating projectiles. So he applied this sort of Bernoulli's principle to, to projectiles that are spinning in the air. So the Magnus effect is the creation of an additional Magnus force on a spinning projectile which deviates from the expected flight path. So in sport, this effect is used to mislead the opposition. So we're talking about spin. It is created by applying an external force outside the centre of mass, we know that. And where this eccentric force is applied will determine the way the projectile spins. So we've got four types. We have top spin, where the eccentric force is applied above the centre of mass and therefore causes the projectile to spin downwards around the transverse axes. You have backspin, where the eccentric force is applied below the centre of mass, causing the projectile to spin upwards around the transverse axes. You then have side spin hook, which is where the force is applied to the right of the centre of mass, which causes the projectile to spin left around the longitudinal axis. So longitudinal is from top to bottom, and that will cause it to deviate to the left. And then you have side spin splice, which is the eccentric force applied to the left of the centre of mass, which causes it to spin right around the axes, causing it to deviate to the right. So the Magnus effect and how this affects spin. So the way the projectile spins will determine the direction, the velocity and the pressure of the airflow around it. So a pressure gradient is formed either side of a spinning projectile and an additional Magnus force is created which then deviates the flight path. So all forms of spin create a non-parabolic flight path because it's deviating from the norm. There is an additional force acting on it. Top spin will create a downward force which will shorten the flight path. Backspin will create an upward force, lengthening the flight path, and then side spin will create a force to the right or to the left. So the way it works, if we take top spin as our example, the upper surface of the projectile will rotate towards the oncoming airflow because it's rotating top to bottom, which opposes the motion. So this decreases the velocity of the airflow. Because the rotation is going against the airflow, it decreases that velocity of airflow, which creates a high pressure zone. Now the lower surface of the projectile is rotating in the same direction as the airflow. And therefore, that will increase the velocity of the airflow, speed it up, and create a low pressure zone. Now that means we've got high pressure above the, the, the ball, low pressure below the ball, and a pressure gradient forms and the Magnus force creates a downwards force. This adds to the weight of the projectile and the effect of gravity is increased. And then that causes the, causes the projectile to dip in flight, giving less time in the air as the flight path shortens. So looking at a direction, so this is a side on view of a, of a ball. You can see the air flow flowing in that direction, shown by the arrows. You can see the direction of the airflow opposes the direction of the motion at the top. So we've got the spin here, spin here, it's top spin, so that's the way it's rotating. You can see at the top, that opposes the direction of the airflow, which means this air is going to flow much slower, causing high pressure. This air though is traveling in the same direction as the spin, and therefore it's gonna travel faster, creating a lower pressure, and therefore high pressure at the top, 
low pressure at the bottom, the, the magnus force is going to cause that projectile to dip to lower. Um, a flight path diagram, so here is your normal flight path parabolic. Now this is what happens when magnus effects happen. So you've got your directional motion, you've got your spin happening in this direction here, which will cause the projectile to dip suddenly. So it's a non-parabolic flight. Remember, the magnus force is always shown from the centre of mass of the projectile. So if we apply this to tennis and table tennis, placing spin on the ball gives it stability in flight. It guides the airflow and reduces the turbulence. So the benefit, take, two se take a couple of minutes, pause the video, I want you to think what would the benefit be of using top spin in tennis or table tennis. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to think about it. So it will shorten the flight path. You can hit the ball much harder whilst it will still land in the court or on the table. It can also confuse the opposition. It, needs, it will bring them closer to the net, put them in a defensive position. Now, backspin. What I would like you to do is, we've just looked a lot into topspin, but what about backspin? It's essentially reversed. So I want you to think about where is the force applied, how is spin created, consider the direction of the airflow, the effect on velocity. What I'd like you to do is draw an airflow diagram demonstrating backspin. I would like you to draw a flight path diagram demonstrating backspin. And I want you to consider what would be the advantage of backspin to a tennis, table tennis player. For an extension task, can you draw a free body diagram of a projectile with backspin in flight and the resultant force diagram with the two vertical forces acting? If you pause the video and complete that task and then we'll go through the answers. Okay, so here I have put the top spin diagrams on for your reference as well. So this is an airflow diagram showing backspin. You can see the direction of the spin because remember the eccentric force has been so, so applied at the bottom of the centre of mass, underneath the centre of mass, causing it to spin in that direction. So you can see direction of the motion here is in this direction here, opposite to the direction of the airflow. So the airflow at the top is going in the same direction as the spin, and therefore that's going to have um, higher velocity. The, the airflow at the bottom is going in the opposite direction of the spin, so it's going to have a lower velocity and a higher pressure, which is going to cause this lift force here. It's going to cause the Magnus effect, it's going to cause the ball to lift. Now if we look at the flight path diagram, so here again we've got top spin shots and flat shots for your reference, but an underspin shot here will cause the ball to go further and land a little bit further away so it causes the ball to almost float in the air and again here we have our forces diagram our free body diagram so backspin you can see that you've got your weight or your gravity you have your drag or your air resistance going in the opposite direction to the motion the flight path you have the direction of spin there and then you have your lift and if you see here so this is the magnus effect on the top spin the magnus effect is going down Okay, so side spin in sport. This is our last, last section. I just want you to consider any examples of when side spin can be used in golf, table tennis, tennis and football. And can you give an example? Because this is what might happen in an exam. They'll ask you to define side spin and give an example used in sport. So if you pause the video and I'd like you to have a go. Okay, so for golf, it can allow the ball to swerve in flight to avoid obstacles, for example, trees or bends in the fairway. Table tennis and tennis, it can confuse the opposition, moving them to outside of the court, table unexpectedly, giving an open court or a table to attack. And in football, bend it like Beckham, we can swerve the ball around a wall in a free kick or into the goal from a corner kick. Okay, and that concludes our biomechanics unit. Well done. Um, email me um, the homework task in the video, um, the diagrams for the ski jumper and the javelin. 
um, and then next week's task will be an end of unit test to recap and, and consolidate all of the learning you've done over the last few weeks.